So she's a senior clinical pharmacist um, at the Alfred Hospital and she's been there for 15 years. Frightening. Um, so? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. Dedication. <laughs> um, so Alison's early pharmacy work um, was actually in the field of general medicine, geriatrics and sterile preparation. She's had some experience working in medical oncology and hematology um, wards, but her passion has always been um, in infectious diseases. And she specialised in the area, um, including HIV, and um, yeah, HIV for 12 years. Um, Alison's role actually includes both um, outpatient and inpatient work at the Alfred, um, and that includes the Melbourne Sexual Health Centre as well. Her favourite things are solving complex drug queries, especially drug interactions, and spending time with patients and helping them understand their illness and treatment options available to them. Alison is also involved in education and training, and she regularly gives lectures and um, presentations to students, doctors, pharmacists, um, and community workers in Melbourne and throughout Victoria. She has established an HIV, um, sorry, she has established an HIV pharmacist and nurses special interest group in Victoria, um, and they meet quarterly. Um, Alison's just recently been to India, um, which is sponsored by Australia India <laughs> Council, um, and she's been there on several occasions. Um, and she helps to provide education to nurses um, about HIV and opportunistic infections in their therapy. So we couldn't think of anyone else more um, suitable to give this topic. So um, thank you, Alison, to talk to us about um, what's new in HIV. Thanks. Thanks, Sonia. Nice to see you all. I'll just move you over here because it's easier to manipulate. Um, thank you all for coming and thank you, Sonia, for asking me. Um, now, let's see if I press down, will that work? Yes. So, what is new? I think the best part about um, working in this field is there's always something new. And um, I thought I'd try and cover the first half dozen things on there and in some significant detail. And then I'll throw a couple of slides in at the end about the other things. And anything else down the bottom that catches your fancy that you fancy asking me, don't hold back. Um, and interrupt if I'm using jargon or carrying on. That's fine with me. <laughs> So, um, just some stats to begin with. So this is a graph, there's a few little graphs in here from the Kirby Institute in New South Wales. Um, so new diagnoses, you can see this is over time and there was a whole pile in the 80s obviously and it dropped away in the 90s. What I would draw your attention to perhaps, and some of you are probably aware of, a slight increase again in the early 2000s which is a bit upsetting. Um, and what we're particularly concerned about is this apparent possible steeper incline <laughs> just in the last year or so um, and in fact at the ASHAM conference last year, so ASHAM is the Australasian Society of HIV Medicine, um, the statistics were released and there was an 8% increase in uh, diagnoses in the previous year which was upsetting for all people who were there. Um, now putting that into context there's only about 1100 or so but that's still more than we wanted it to be and it's more than it was the year before. So there's some stuff going on that we need to have a little look at. Um, how many are in Victoria? It's usually between 250 and 300. I don't think it's been 300 for quite some time, but 280 or so in that year. And our population of HIV positive people hasn't really changed that much. It's usually MSM in this country. Don't get too excited about the colours and, and lines and stuff here, but it, it's another Kirby line. And I would just draw your attention to the red line and the blue line. That would be the uh, new diagnoses per state, and the red and the blue are um, New South Wales and Victoria. And you can see, obviously, we're the most populous state, so obviously we're always going to be higher. But we're also leading the pack in the sense of an increase recently, which is upsetting. <laughs> so we kind of we knew about this one in Victoria and we were worried about it and then we thought, oh, maybe we're back on track again and perhaps, no, we're not back on track after all. Um, just to put it into complete world context, we're really not in a problem area. There's like, like less than 100 per 100,000 incidence or prevalence rather, um, whereas New Guinea, our nearest neighbour is you know, nine times as many. So still not very many, but it's more than we want it to be. So that's what I was talking about just now. Of some concern is that perhaps 20 or 30 percent of people who are infected are completely unaware of it, um, and that's data from the Burnett Institute. They did a study called Suck It and See, and they went around to some clubs and, and venues and such and asked people if they'd take a saliva test and did they think they were positive or not, and the 30 percent of them were unaware of their diagnosis. Um, so that's a bit hairy. And we also think that 
a lot of people are not taking therapy countrywide necessarily. You don't have to take it, obviously it's your choice. Um, and there's a point where you would like to take it. We'll go, go through that later. Um, so the few things that came out at the end of last year we were going, hmm, things are not quite right. And the topic of the year really at every conference that you went to was this thing called the Treatment Cascade. Um, all the big American conferences. So I've stolen this directly from the internet, but essentially a slide like this was presented at all of the big conferences last year, and I'll go through it with you. Um, so all American data. So of the million and a so that they think, million and a bit, that they think are infected, how many are actually diagnosed? Nearly 900,000. So there's about 20% there that aren't necessarily aware of their diagnosis. For those that are aware of their diagnosis in America, linking to care <coughs> might be the challenge. So there's about a quarter of them don't come and see anybody about it. And of those, do they stay in care? So of the 800 or 900,000, 50% of them are not seeing somebody regularly about this. Um, of the 800, 900, 874,000 that are diagnosed and needing therapy, um, how many are on therapy? There's about 25% who are eligible and not taking it. And of those who are, who are taking it, how many have an undetectable viral load? Um, that's not too bad, about 80%. So if you look at the figures in, in the big context and zoom out, and you go, well, there's a million and a, a bit people who are HIV infected in America, and there's only 200,000 of those who are, who are healthy and at no risk to themselves or anybody else. So the Americans are quite worried and they're panicking about this quietly and what can we do? Um, there's a lot of things that I suppose they can do. The whole linked care and retained in care, I guess, is a challenge across the way. So um, David uh, Wilson at the Kirby Institute, he's an epidemiologist, thought he might have a bit of a crack at do we have this thing going on in Australia as well? Is, is there a cascade here? Um, so starting with who might be aware of their diagnosis, he did that by, oh, he spoke about this at a conference, I'm going to try and tell you what he said. Um, he worked out how many people had ever been since, since we started collecting statistics diagnosed. That's about 32,000. And then you take away the 8,000 people that have died for various reasons. It gives you 24,500 who are aware of their diagnosis. Um, so remembering back to the figure we had before, that there's about 30% in Victoria who are unaware of their diagnosis, that means that in this country there's somewhere between 31 and 35,000 people who are living with HIV. There's a slight drop there. Um, Link to care and remain in care, there's no data and there's nothing we can collect to know, but um, it's not too bad in this country. Obviously, all of us in all of our fields have patients who fail to attend and are lost to follow up, but not too bad. I don't think there's a major problem there, but we have no data. So of the 24,000 that are diagnosed, how many are on therapy? And you think to yourself, oh yeah, we know that. We know how many prescriptions are dispensed and we've got all that data, it's sitting in Medicare somewhere. Well, the answer is no, we don't know that. We know how many individual drugs are dispensed, but we don't know which patient's taking which combination of individual drugs. They could be taking two, they could be taking one, they could be taking three, could be taking six. So we know how many dispensings there are, but we don't know how many um, drugs that people are taking necessarily. This figure is sort of established from, um, if you ask patients, there's a periodical survey done um, called Futures Study, if you ask them and they self-report at about 70% taking their medicine, so, so it could be higher than 1,100. David got 1,100 based on the um, Australian HIV observational database, which is a group of a couple of thousand people, and he looked at what different types of regimens all of those people were taking, and then he tried to work out based on that and the data from the highly specialised drugs program, approximately who was taking what and therefore how many people. So anything between 1,100 people and perhaps 1,700 people of the 24 are actually on treatment at the moment. So we go with the lower estimate because self-report is not necessarily the gold standard there. So between 50 and maybe 70% of people are taking therapy in this country. So how many of those have undetectable viral loads? Um, certainly I know our patient group to a degree are fairly well suppressed. Um, Professor Hoy is obviously very big on that. She's big on getting everybody who's eligible on treatment and then getting their viral load suppressed. So ours would probably be about 95%. But 
different places, different data. You can't necessarily collect it. So once again, um, David Wilson had a little look at the observational database over time and had a little look at those couple of thousand people and how they were going with suppressed viral load. And you can see it's gone up. And so this CD4 count, which is fantastic. So those people are obviously doing very well. So um, for those on treatment, looks like 80 or 90 percent of them perhaps doing very well. So we'd have to say probably most of our patients who are actually swallowing the pills are, are doing the right thing and they're, they're on undetectable. So they're at no risk to them and they're no, no risk either to their um, partners. Yeah, so the Australian Cascade, we need to do something a little bit to tighten it up. <coughs> So based on that sort of cascade data and the 8% increase at the conference last year, there was a declaration made, as there often is at these conferences, you know, a big mission statement. Um, so the mission statement is to reduce the, the rates of new HIV infections by half in a couple of years. So there's a few things that they want to do, and there's their magic poster. And we'll talk about a couple of those things that would help, we think. Um, so for action areas, um, get us where we want to be. So we want people to get tested more often and make it easier for them to do that. Um, we want them to have quick and easy access to antiretrovirals. Uh, we want to talk about pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, and there's a bit of a motherhood statement there about partnerships and making sure the community is involved in all of those things, which of course is actually very important. So I thought we might talk about a couple of things in the top three there. So rapid HIV testing, so point of care tests. So you probably know about them a little bit. The Americans have had them for ages you, and they used it in that study I talked about just before, the saliva tests and things. Why haven't they been available in this country? Um, many reasons, but uh, we'll talk to you about point of care testing and um, go through it. So essentially what we want is to get people tested very quickly. Um, and for people who are really at risk, that don't want to go to the doctor um, or don't want to wait a month for their results to come back, um, we want them to come in and have a rapid test if we can. Um, and getting them early is the key. So if they're really just infected a couple of weeks ago, they're incredibly infectious as compared to infected 10 years ago. Um, they're really, really infectious. So if we can catch those people at that time, that'd be brilliant. Um, so and if we can catch them, then it'd be brilliant for the population at large and for the person themselves. Um, so the oral tests that the Americans have were not approved in this country for varying and many reasons, but we have approved something late last year which is better. Um, it's got a name there, a Lear determined combo test. Um, it comes in a, as far as I know, it comes as a strip of those bits of paper things there and it's a pinprick of blood and it's a bit like a pregnancy test, you know, it's got two lines on it and comes up with a control or a positive and a control. Um, so that's how they work. So those are coming soon. And they are approved by the TGA, coming soon. Um, now, how do they work and why are they better? I'll try and explain this to you. I've stolen this directly from the uh, company's website, so I haven't got the groovy graphics, but I've got the picture. So if I try and tell you, so if you're infected over here somewhere on the left, uh, the red line is your HIV viral load, which will obviously go sky high. Over on the right-hand side, it will, as your antibodies pop up, varying, to varying degrees, your viral load will decline and everybody's different, so you can't really say, so that's why the line diverges a bit there. So your antibodies take up, you know, maybe 20 or 30 days to do something. This little green line here is an antigen that sticks out of HIV, like, like all viruses. It's got lots of protein sticking out of its surface, so it's called P24. So all the old tests, like the saliva ones and stuff, they detected your antibodies, which is fabulous, but if you think of time since you were infected, that's a fair old while. Um, so if we can detect your antigen as well as your antibody, that's the aim of the game, um, and that's what the new test does. So that's just a picture of the same thing spread out a bit. Um, so you've got this kind of additional, I don't know, 10 or so day window, which is really good. Uh, if you're a young bloke and you've done something silly and you're unaware, you can have a test somewhere in Smith Street or whatever it happens to be, wherever they set up the testing and detecting, and you can know and be less infectious to other people straight away. So that's the aim there. So it's not going to be over the counter and you can't buy it on the internet and, and it needs to be 
used by accredited people. Um, basically, it's not completely implemented yet, and international research shows that this is the way to go. You don't just buy it over the counter. Um, and ASHRAM is actually developing its standards for, for the curriculum for the people. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a nurse or a lab person, or just certainly doesn't have to be a doctor, but they, the person will have to attend and um, uh, go through the curriculum. And I've seen a draft copy, it looks really good. Um, stuff, everything from not mucking up the reagents to counselling people about false positives and false negatives and those kind of things, and other tests that they can do and answering other questions. So, yeah. Coming soon to a place near you, probably there'll be one obviously, in, I imagine, in Paran, a place where you might go, and there'll probably be a place in Fitzroy or something that you might go. Certainly, there's a big conference on next year in Melbourne, and I think the, it's a big international conference. I think if the government hasn't implemented it by then, they'll look um, very bad, so cross fingers it'll be done this year. Um, well, we've already said all that stuff, so basically we want to get people diagnosed more quickly. Um, what we would aim to do, just using a, another Kirby Institute picture here, um, is reduce the number of newly acquired infections. So that's the red bit in this graph. So it's always around two or 300 people over time. But if we could catch people earlier, then they would know they're, they're positive. They wouldn't do anything silly. Then the next person they're a partner with won't become positive. So if we can reduce that by half in a couple of years, that's the aim of the game. Um, so there's always going to be the people who present late that were completely unaware. That's not something that you can rapidly change, but we might like to rapidly change um, the people who are attending pubs and clubs and things and get them tested more frequently. Um, and if we do that, this is another Kirby Institute thingy, see, nothing has changed much over time there. Uh, the CD4 count at diagnosis is always about 40% who are diagnosed when they've got lots of CD4s, which is great. Um, there's always about 20% who pop up when they've got hardly any, and they're of course the ones we see at the hospital. Um, but if we could uh, increase the number that we catch when they've got really good CD4s, then we've got more room to work to make them better in the longer term. So it's kind of an aim of the game. So, a couple of bits and pieces about treatment as prevention. If I go on treatment, can I be less infectious for partners? Um, so obviously, no matter the, the higher your viral load is, the more risk <coughs> there are of transmitting virus. Um, if you go on to combination therapy, you're going to lower your viral load and perhaps you'll be then less infectious. Um, so you need to know and you need to then get on treatment. Um, and in couples, there's some really good observational um, evidence that transmission doesn't happen um, or treatment does prevent the non-infected partner from becoming infected. Um, so we don't really know when you would start antiretroviral therapy. Obviously, if you showed up at the hospital and you had lymphoma and your CD4 count was two, of course you would start. But if you had 570, does that mean you would start then? Nobody knows is the answer. But if you had a partner or you were at risk in some way, perhaps that would be the ideal time to start. Um, starting the old seesaw. Pretty much years ago, everybody was on me, don't do it, it's horrible, the drugs are awful, nobody likes them, you won't, won't enjoy it kind of side of the seesaw. Everyone, everyone has swung to the earlier. Good for the person. Um, drugs are much better, much easier. Um, and good for the community at large. Less, less transmission. So kind of fitting in there. Uh, so there's been some studies in African, mainly heterosexual couples, and they've been relatively successful. So the first one was um, looking at HSV and HIV transmission and there were people who, the partner who was infected either got treatment or they didn't at the time and they all got lots of good counselling about what they were doing and they followed these people up for two years um, and they did uh, extraordinarily well. Those who were on treatment had a 92% less risk of an infection than those who weren't. So looking promising in that regard. So the other one, HPT and it's called. Um, this is similar design, but everybody who's infected got treatment right now, or they've waited a few months until their CD4 was a bit lower, because I think that was the WHO recommendation at the time. Similar kind of setup, um, lots of counselling, making sure they're all okay with what safe sex was and all of those things. Um, similar plan to follow up, um, but the trial had to stop early because there was such a huge benefit 
from starting treatment straight away, both in the patient um, themselves, because they get less, less excuse me, opportunistic illnesses, but also for the partner in the sense that huge numbers of them didn't seroconvert, which is great. Um, the only thing is, does that translate in Australia or San Francisco? Does that work if you're a gay couple? We don't know. And you've got to have a randomised trial on that one. Um, so there is some promising statistics and thoughts, you know, especially in big places like San Francisco, Toronto as well. Oh, not Toronto, Vancouver, I apologise. And also in the UK where they do have these rapid tests and they have really, especially in San Francisco, they have a really cool shop front where you can just show up and have your... Um, have your test done then and there and you'll know in 20 minutes whether you're positive or not and, and there's lots of other support services within that shop front. looks like a hairdresser rather than a clinic. Obviously the, it's got four rooms I think and the further you go back the more it looks like a clinic but <laughs> in the front it just looks like somewhere fun to go. Um, so increased testing increases the chances that you'll know what's going on, decreases the chances you'll do something stupid, more people might get onto therapy and there's this talk in the HIV world about the population viral load. If you reduce the viral load that's out there in the young blokes in San Francisco, does that then prevent other young blokes from seroconverting? We hope so. Um, so obviously to do all that you need them to have access just as I was describing and you need them to care and be involved and understand that this is the way to go. Um, there's a couple of studies that are going forward. I think the partner studies in America, the one that's going here is called Opposites Attract. That's for gay men in couples and they're going to watch them over time and see how they go. So it's similar to what we were describing in the South African people, but it will be gay men to see how they go. There's only one way to find out if this works. Um, just as a broader philosophical thing, if we do treatment earlier and treatment as prevention, I pitched this slide from Ken, Kenneth Meyer who um, spoke with us at Ashram Talk a month or so ago. It's a bit complicated, but I'll explain it to you. If you, if you go across the, um, the top, that's millions of people who would be eligible for treatment and lower middle income countries. So in the box on the left there, if you go with the old WHO recommendations, less than 200, that would be 11 million people needing treatment. About 8 million people on treatment in the world now, let me just let you know. So, so even if we went with the old recommendation, there's plenty of people who are missing out. If you go with the current um, CD4 recommendation from the WHO, that would be 15 million people needing treatment. If you go with the current recommendations and treatment as prevention, so treating MSM who are doing dangerous bits and bobs, sex workers, perhaps IVDUs, um, obviously serial discordant couples, pregnant people, that would be 23 million people. If you treat almost anyone standing still long enough, um, that would be about 25 million people. The 34 less than 500 is kind of where the Americans sit in the international guidelines. And absolutely everybody is 32 million people, so it's just a broad philosophy to think about there. <laughs> okay. Um, now, this is a slide that I've pinched. There's a few slides here from Clinical Options. I'm not sure if you guys know about Clinical Options, so they're a brilliant, brilliant site. Obviously, you don't have to use the HIV site. Um, <laughs> they also do hepatitis, they do um, oncology and neurology, and they send you interesting slides and slide sets and updates from conferences. So, if any of you are unaware of Clinical Options, can go with them. Um, I just pinched a couple of their slides for this. So this is what the Americans, they update their uh, Department of Health and Human Services guidelines a couple of times a year and basically they say, get everyone on treatment now, apart from the people, the individuals who might elect to defer. Can we do that here? Um, yes and no. You can't officially have treatment if you're um, not symptomatic or your CD4 count is uh, above 500. So Ashram's thinking about talking to the government about changing this to make it a little bit more uh, patient, um, patient centric really, whether the patient actually needs it, whether their partner needs it, whether it's better all round, so they're, they're psychologically going to be better off. So Ashram's talking to people about that. So we'll see how we go. Um, now, treatment reminds me of another curvy graph here. Don't worry too much again about the lines, but um, just kind of what people are taking. This is the database again, the observational database, what people are taking and I find this fun. Um, you can see that this is where raltegravir took off, integrase inhibitor. You can see that protease inhibitors are going down. So the number of people not taking treatment is maybe less than 10%, it's a bit hard to tell there, but maybe less than 10% of not taking anything. 
Um, and I think this is the rise and rise of AFFF and friends. So those are the where the people are in the way of drugs and what they're taking. So, drugs. That's where you're here. All that other stuff's really interesting, but you have to know drugs. Um, so I thought we might talk about new ones, new combination ones, new formulations, new weird applications that might happen. Um, so just to get you up to speed a bit new over the past couple of years, just in case you're unaware of them, um, the new protease inhibitor called Arinavir, which is really good and really powerful, has quite a low resistance barrier, sorry, high resistance barrier, <laughs> it's a very forgiving medication. Um, can't use it in treatment naive in this country, but it is being used in treatment naive people overseas. So it's a great drug. Um, Raltegravir, we just mentioned that briefly a minute ago, that's an integrase inhibitor, stops virus integrating into your DNA. Um, that's uh, also a good drug in the right person. It has to be given twice a day, which is rather unfortunate. Um, and the person can't be mucking about with it. So they have to have a nice strong backbone and they have to be willing to take it twice a day, otherwise resistance pops up rather. But it's really excellent in that it doesn't hardly have any side effects and people who go on it are, are do really well. So the right person. And the other drug new in the last few years is etrovirin, which is a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. And it is mostly used second line. Um, so if you've already tried viropin or efavirenz and don't have too many resistance mutations, you can go on to atrovirin. Um, twice a day dosing, and it's a bit powdery when you swallow the damn thing. Um, so not brilliant patient friendly, but brilliant in the sense of salvage. So that a lot of our patients who are on some or all of these drugs, and in fact we call it the red combination, to go on these for highly treatment experienced patients, and it's brought a lot of people back from the brink going on these three. So things have rapidly changed in the last few years. So going forward, um, well actually not too very forward, going to now. <laughs> going to now, the one on the left is called the Piverine. It's also a non-nucleoside drug and it's going to be for first line use. It's been available for, well I don't know, six, bit more months, probably a bit longer than that now. Um, also really good for the right person, but a little bit weak. Can't have any antacids in your system, can't have a high viral load when you start, and you have to eat something with it. That doesn't sound too hard to you and I, but um, some people have quite chaotic lifestyles, so you have to choose wisely. But once you're once you're in, it'll be fine. Um, so and it's going to be a three. In, it is sorry, a three in one drug. Um, so it's got tenofovir, amitriptyline, or piperin. So for the right person, this drug's going to be great. Hardly any drug interactions. As long as you eat something with it, Bob's your uncle. It'll be great. So the one on the right hand side, Elvitegravir, is coming, 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 um, not quite there, it's a new integrase inhibitor. Um, it's also going to be for first line use. Um, unlike Raltegravir, it needs boosting, so you need, and the drug company invented their own boosting drug called Probisistat, I'll talk to you about that in a minute. So consequently you can use it daily, which is great. Um, so it's got this weird name, Strybuild. Um, and the TGA have given it the rubber stamp, but the PBS are still arguing back and forward apparently about money and something. So we hope this year that this will be. It's been available in America for a wee what, for probably six months and probably as long in the UK. So it's cool. I'll just probably call it the quad drug, just because that's what all the trials have been called. I'm not sure I really like Strybuild as a name. <laughs> I'll go with quad pill. So four in one, it'll be great. Um, so what is this stuff, this CODBC stat? Um, it's essentially, they, the company who makes this is uh, Gilead, as I recall, and they didn't want to get involved with ritonavir, so they made their own drug. So it doesn't have any antiretroviral action, but it inhibits P450, which is terrific, so you get nice boosting so you can have your active drugs once a day. Um, so that's good to know. Um, the other thing that's important to know going forward for you fellows, if you see this, you know, this time next year you see this quad pill and somebody's in and they come into the hospital with it, it's a booster and it does some funny things. Strangely, it inhibits the excretion of creatinine. Um, so in a couple of weeks, if you measure it before and after, your serum creatinine goes up, it stays up the whole time and it doesn't go any higher, which is handy. And it's not an indicator of renal impairment, it's just an indicator that there's a lot more creatinine drifting around in your system. It's not getting passed out of that particular thing. If you measure the person's GFR another way, there's no change. They're, actual, they're still peeing just as much as they were before. Um, so I guess be aware of this drug, but it does that. Um, and I've pinched a couple of company slides 
about that just so that you kind of know in the back of your mind if someone pops up. Um, so these are healthy volunteers, I think. Uh, this is when they were taking the COVID stat compared to the placebo, and you can see their estimated GFR drops down and comes back to normal. But when they measured it with this other thing, which I've never heard of, IOHixol, um, the actual GFR doesn't change at all. So good to know. Um, and even better to know from the drug company again. So it sits there, it inhibits creatinine clearance, but doesn't change it, um, actual GFR. So does, interestingly, ritonavir, which I strangely never knew. <laughs> um, I'll never forget it now. And trimethoprim, which I also didn't know. So if you've ever had somebody had weird changes in their serum creatinine and you wondered why <laughs> trimethoprim, that would be it. Um, so good to know. Dog utility is on there too. Um, now, just so you know how it goes up and what happens. So on the left, uh, this would be the quad pill, the orange colour. This would be uh, atrial flow down the bottom there. So you can see in about two weeks, bang, up goes the serum creatinine, and it just stays the same the whole way across. And it doesn't do that with the blue blue line, so the atrial that doesn't have that COBC stat in it. So no real change. It goes out 48 weeks. It's always about the same. Um, what's on this side? Same thing, orange line is the quad pill with the COBC stat. Green one is Truvada with um, boosted atazanavir. So you can see, good old ritonavir causes the same thing. So you get slight rise in serum creatinine and it ends up the same at the end. So all of this time I hadn't realised that. Good that you made me do this talk because I'm learning something from it. <laughs> Work everybody. <laughs> so there you go, it does increase it a little bit. How does it do it? I've stolen this from them once again and I do not pertain to be a specialist on kidney excretion, even slightly. I know that OCT stands for organic cation transporter and the MATE stands for something like human toxic oh, drugs and compounds, drugs and toxins extrusion or something like that. Essentially it works there. Um, creatinine goes out through that, um, it's picked up and pushed out through that and the drugs that we're talking about stop one of those pathways from happening. I think creatinine can still drift out other ways. Um, but good to know. And I think going forward we're going to hear more about these little receptors and where our drugs are fiddling around with them. Um, and interestingly, dolutegravir, which I'll tell you about in a second, seems to stop that one. So there you go. You might get a slight raise in your creatinine when you're on that as well. So good to know. Um, not to worry too much about it. The company obviously were panicking terribly about it a number of years ago and they were looking carefully at people and not giving it to people who are over 60 and various other things. But they've um, since decided that generally speaking, what happens is your creatinine goes up and then nothing happens. So you, you, you take it and then you'd have a little look a couple of weeks later and if it hadn't dramatically gone off, then you know what the problem is. And if it does dramatically go off, it's probably not the COBC step, but it may be something else. Um, and tenofovir itself is a problem in kidneys, so you'd be looking for um, tubulopathies and things and perhaps changing, but it won't be the COBC stat that does it. Um, drug interactions, well, of course there are. It's a P450 inhibitor. Also annoyingly seems to inhibit pig lipoprotein and a couple of those, that's organic anion transporters and things like that. So obviously you would have to be a bit wary if a person's on the quad pill and they show up and suddenly they need, I don't know, bypass grafts or something think about which stat you'd give them. Uh, essentially not to worry too much but treat it like an enzyme inhibitor. Um, and we don't really know because it's metabolised by 3A4, if you're on a really strong inhibitor of 3A4, what high levels of COVID stat do to you. That will be something the company will need to let us know. Okie okay, dokie, other drugs. Um, so that one on the left I mentioned earlier, Olutegravir. That's an integrase inhibitor too, um, and that is looking really, really good. And I keep thinking any minute now they're going to launch it, but um, no, not quite. It's still got compassionate access programs going. Um, we've got a couple of fellows taking it on a compassionate access, and it's been life-saving for them. Um, they need to take it twice a day because it's a really treatment experience. But the company are kind of looking at people who haven't taken drugs much before, um, daily dose for them. And possibly it's better than raltegravir, which is handy. Um, because it's daily, and it's a glasso or vive drug, so it'll probably be co-formulated with um, Kypex, so it'll be handy. So it'll be one pill once a day competition. Um, so that's just a wee slide. Don't worry too much about the detail, but that's essentially people who haven't 
had they have had treatment before, but they haven't had this class of drug before, and so they got randomised to one or the other of the integrated inhibitors plus an optimised background. And to me, it looks after 24 weeks that possibly dolutegravir is a little bit better at, at getting people's viral load down. So watch this space and we'll see what happens. Um, other drugs. So there's lots of drugs that don't have names yet. Um, MK, whatever it is, I think that's a non-nucleoside and don't again worry about the content of this slide, but essentially looks like you can take anything between 25 and 200 daily and it seems to give you in seven days a nice viral drop, so I guess that's going to go far, but <laughs> we'll just have to wait and see what they do with it. Um, what about this one here that's not also got a name? Um, I think it's an integrated inhibitor and it's either going to be oral and once again you get a nice um, drop in your viral load. Or intramuscular, interesting. An 800 milligram dose seems to have a nice almost four week half life. How potentially useful will this be going forward? Um, and they've been playing around with some poor old macaques and giving them a dose and um, then serially testing them against SIV and um, it seems to prevent exposure, which is good, or preventing SIV serial conversion, which seems to be the way to go. So I guess stuff will happen. All right, uh, new formulations of old drugs. So there's this tenofovir you probably know needs to be given as a prodrug because it doesn't get absorbed. So the current formulation is a prodrug and that's terrific. And in the um, plasma, it switches to tenofovir and then off it goes and does its job. Um, but this, they decided, the drug company, to have a look at another prodrug that only converts the <coughs> to the tenofovir right at the site of action in the lymphoid cells rather than in the plasma. And that's because tenofovir drifting around in your system is not necessarily a good thing might give you some bone toxicity, give you osteopenia, might give you renal impairment. Um, so that's what they're hoping to prevent going forward. So I think it's more than we're coming off patients, we need a new formulation. I think it's actually that we care and we're worried about <laughs> an <offer beer. laughs> I think, I think. Um, so there's trials going on with that even as we speak. Um, I don't know if we're doing that particular one at the Alpha Group. I know we're doing it at Melbourne Sexual Health. Um, so that's just on the left, this is just a picture of where it works, so tenofovir doesn't get in at all. Tenofovir by fumarate or whatever it is, does get in and switches over to tenofovir um, in the plasma and does its job. TAF, which I'll call it, um, stays as TAF until it gets exactly where it needs to be and then it changes to the drug that is going to do the job, which is great. Um, so the company are having a little look, as I said, they're um, trying to work out whether this is better, worse, or different, indifferent to their current formulation, which is the one that we talked about with the quad pill that we talked about before, which is as yet not launched here, but they're essentially comparing the quad pill with the one with TAF in it, and they're going to look for two years. Um, they've got 24-week data, and essentially they look excellent, equal so far. And they were looking for their side effects more than, I suppose you have to prove they're equivalent neurologically, but essentially what they really want to know is are they better in the sense of side effects. So at the bottom of this slide is two graphs of people's uh, bone mineral density changes over 24 weeks. And the people on the quad pill, so the old formulation of tenofovir, seem to have perhaps more loss of bone, hips and spines compared to the people on the new formulation. And also they, they found that the serum creatinine went up in both, but seemingly less in the um, new formulation. So watch this space. I think it's, it's probably going to be a couple of years because they'll probably have to go another year on this trial plus whatever else. So looks promising. New ideas. Um, Tenofovir in a ring. They've fiddled around with some, once again, poor old monkeys. They get everything, don't they? They get an <laughs> intravaginal ring. Um, essentially, they got uh, a ring put in once a month for four months. And they also had a challenge of S SIV. And basically, they were looking to see how the monkeys did and whether there was anything changes. There was no seroconversions. There was no toxicity and no changes to the microflora. So that's probably going to go forward as well. All right. Something that's a novel idea, perhaps to you, not so much to me. So we all know about post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, what about pre exposure prophylaxis, would that stop people getting this disease? So there have been a number of trials in other countries, a little bit trials, not, not here, but a uh, couple in America, um, mostly in heterosexual couples to see if you can prevent transmission. 
and they've mostly been synophobia ultrabiotic type things daily and if you don't hear anything else I say adherence, 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 if you don't do it it's not going to work um, these are a number of them um, which I won't expect you to remember or learn or anything but I do remember when the Caprisa one was coming out, it was a big conference a couple of years ago and it surprised them how well it was um, synophobia gel around the time of intercourse and the ladies who did it really really well had a massive reduction in their transmission rate and the doctor, the people who set the trial up weren't looking for that, they were just looking to see if anything happened, they were looking at levels and whether it was toxic and whether the people would use it and stuff and they went, oh, nearly 40% didn't have transmission, oh, okay, well, perhaps we'll go a bit further. So there's been a few since then, um, serodiscordant couples obviously do reasonably well because they care about their partner. Um, not so bad there, however, this one down here, this fem prep in Africa, that had to be stopped lack of efficacy and this one called voice which I won't go through this slide too detailed the one called voice essentially also got stopped early I, I will go through it but don't try and read it because it's a bit hard to grasp um, this is a whole bunch of 5,000 women across varying South African places um, and they got either given tenofovir or Truvada or a vaginal gel with tenofovir in every day to see if it would prevent transmission um, they stopped the gel and the plain tenofovir arms early because it wasn't working um, and in the end, basically none of them worked. So this is a bit hard to read, but if you have a good daily tenofovir versus placebo, the infection's possibly more <laughs> in the tenofovir daily arm than in the placebo. Um, Truvada versus placebo about the same, and the gel, uh, perhaps a fraction less. So not working, had to stop early. What was going on? Did they check adherence on this? Yes, they did actually. They asked patients and patients brought things back and they did a count of what was left and it looked like it was about 90% so that was fabulous however yeah the overall incidence in the, over the time was nearly 6% so basically nothing helped what went wrong um, incidence interestingly when they looked out at the subgroups of people the um, transmission was really high in young women and unmarried women so the figures are there um, incidence per 100 person years, if you're less than 25, 8.7. If you're greater than 25, half of that. If you're married, 0.9. So it's something about you and you thinking about where you're going and you're thinking about your partner as opposed to being young and carefree, I think. Um, and adherence, adherence, adherence. Despite the fact that people brought back, you know, 90% of their pills were taken and they said they were doing really well. In fact, they took blood levels, cunningly, on all these people. And... Um, I think most about 20% of them, there's a picture here, um, yeah, started reasonably well at the first quarterly visit, but um, in fact none of them really had detectable decent levels of tenofovir, so if you don't take it, it's not going to work, is the clue there. Right, so just a couple of slides about hepatitis, just to remind me to remind you, I suppose. Um, you probably know that treating hepatitis C is going to evolve rapidly in the next couple of years and you guys need to be onto it. Um, it's going to be faster than you can keep up with. It's going to be like um, antiretroviral things. That, yeah, HIV. It's going to be a little bit like HIV but faster. So there are new drugs um, and it's a whole talk in itself, hepatitis C going forward. Being co-infected is worse for both. You do worse out of your HIV, you do worse with your um, hepatitis C, particularly if you're unlucky enough to have genotype 1 of hepatitis C, it seems to be nastier. Um, there are a couple of new drugs available, you probably know about them, do you? Bisoprevir, teleprevir, have I got them on there? Whoops, I've gone too far, but bisoprevir and teleprevir are the names of the two drugs that are currently available. They'll probably be superseded rapidly over the next three, four years, I imagine we'll never hear from them again after that. Um, essentially, if you add this to interferon ribavirin, um, you get massively better cure rates than ever before, even in um, genotype 1. So almost up to 70% of people who failed a previous time, you can tolerate the appropriate amount of the or telepravir with your interferon ribavirin. You do all right. Um, so it's really amazing. Points down the bottom, um, significant side effects really dreadful. You have to take lots of them. Um, they're like the old protease inhibitors for HIV. Um, and they're both P450 drugs, so they're problematic. You have to take each of them. One of them's, you can 
They're both three times a day, although telepathy occasionally you can double it up and take it just twice a day. They both have dreadful side effects. And so it's for the right person it might be okay to get on these, especially if you need treatment right now and you, you can hang in there. Um, but other people are waiting because there's stuff in the wings. Um, so problems if you're co-infected, but separately you can't be used with any of the protease inhibitors because they just don't know the drug interactions will be significant. Um, Teleprevir can only be used with limited numbers of them, so people who are considering going on treatment now are having to switch treatment, switch antiviral treatments so that they can go on to these so that they can get their hep C sorted out. So it's a little bit complicated for the um, hepatitis doctors. So newer drugs are looking really, really promising. Um, probably Gilead bought this, mass, this drug called Sofuzabir for nine billion dollars or something. I can't remember. It was a massive amount of money last a couple of years ago, um, and it will be oral. And it, as far as we know, is relatively side effect free. A couple of our patients are on a trial with it at the moment, and they're happy as Larry. Oral without interferon is going to be the way forward. So probably this drug with ribavirin and a third drug, probably co-formulated, and probably a three-in-one that you'll be taking for your hepatitis C. It's all very easy for me to speculate about this, but I think that's probably where it's going, because nobody likes interferon. Um, now, do I have anything? Oh, yeah, I've just got one slide on that, just not for you to read in detail, but for, to remind me to tell you um, that acute hepatitis C is on the rise in men who have sex with men. Um, there's a couple of studies there um, in the quad study. There was just 17 cases, and they went, oh, what's going on here? <laughs> so all these blokes who are on this trial, they're doing the right thing, and they're all seroconverting to hepatitis C. Um, and certainly Joe Sassage, who works at the Melbourne and at the Alfred, he went over to the... Royal Free in London, he looked at a huge group of people and they're also reacquiring their hepatitis C at rapid rates. So this data here is an observational study where they looked at 64 fellows and um, 33 got rid of their virus um, or had some treatment. And they watched them for a number of years and see what popped up next. Some of them got the same infection back, some of them got a different infection. So the people are spreading this sexually. Um, so there's a problem with hepatitis C infection in our MSM and it's the same here as it is in the UK, probably as it is in America. Okay, just a couple of wee things about comorbidities. If we're getting our blokes on treatment, are they doing better um, with respect to their cardiovascular kidney and bone health? What about cancers and things? The answer is generally yes, um, but our chaps still succumb a little bit earlier to these things that all of us to come to. Um, now this is once again a bit of a difficult study uh, slide, but it's from the veterans cohort in America, so there's always thousands and thousands of people in these cohorts. And what they looked at was the chance of you having an end stage renal disease or a myocardial infarction and all cancers. And basically, the take home message from this is you, you, yes, you did, and you did a little bit earlier, a little bit younger than the general population, and slightly more risk than the general population. With respect to cancer, um, you can have a look at the um, orange and the green, they're HIV associated cancers, so KS and lymphoma. You get on treatment, they're on the left, they just disappear off into the sunset, which is great. Other cancers, they just stay exactly they, as they were, and so people, generally people, positive people, are at the same risk of non HIV related cancers as everybody else, except perhaps lung cancer, but, and we still don't know if that's because they all smoke or whether there's something else going on huge percentage of our fellows are smokers, so whether that will change over time. Um, and this is also a bit busy, but essentially um, cardiovascular disease, we think, people succumb a little bit earlier, as I said, and this is the uh, observational database of uh, drugs and adverse effects, and there's like 40-something thousand people in this cohort across the world, and they just generally look at weird side effects, and they choose drugs, and they say, has this happened? Has cholesterol gone off? And they try and put associations together, because there's 40,000 people in the group, and they figure they can have a look. So they looked, and there's a, there's a signal that people are having sort of cardiovascular disease um, in, in the cohort. Um, and there's a couple of models down the bottom here about how you're going. So the green line is positive men, purple, positive women. So it looks like, based on statistics, people do slightly less well if they're positive. It looks like cumulative risk is about the same, and people might here might be perhaps dying of other things. So that's kind of...
kind of what you need to know. Um, that's the update from the health department again, and I've thrown the things on the bottom there. Uh, Real Piverine, like I said before, that Abbey too, as long as you've got a lowish or a low, not really low, but less than 100,000. Um, quad pill can be taken as a start up regimen, um, and they've put in a creatinine clearance, decent sort of measurement. You wouldn't probably start it in somebody who had low, to low creatinine clearance. Um, and the other things on the next page, don't worry about all of this stuff, but apart from the fact that they want everyone to start treatment. The thing on this page that I wanted to tell you, for those of you who are aware, Bavarin's, um was pretty much discouraged in pregnancy because there was a couple of monkeys who had some um, neural tube de defects, if I remember. Um, but there's been a lot of ladies who fall pregnant, didn't know they were pregnant, and were taking Bavarin's the whole time. Um, and there's a large pregnancy database um, kept by America and you can submit all your reports and there's essentially over the last half dozen years there's been no more reports of adverse problems or territory to this than your babies being born with funny defects or those who are st stuck on their efavirenz because they knew no better than any other drug. So I think the average birth deformity type problem rate is about 2.5% and the rate for Favarins is like 2.4% or something. So it's okay if people, you don't actively put somebody on it, but if they're still on it now and by the time you've worked it out, they're almost past their third trimester anyway and nothing's going to really change in that regard, you just keep them on it. So there's lots of changes going on with that. Um, so things that are changing, lots of things all of the time, treatment guidelines, lots of things basically changing. Um, and I'll finish by saying um, a quick plug. This time next year, or there'll be much fanfare and going on. There's a big, the International AIDS Conference is in Melbourne. Um, so it's going to be really big and really new. If you have the opportunity to go, it's really, I've been to two of these, um, one in Europe and one in Mexico. They are huge. 20,000 people go to these. They're um, for everybody. They're for patients. They're for advocacy groups. They're for professors. They're for everybody. Everybody. They have streams of um, streams of uh, clinical stream, legal stream, social work stream. So you you can't ever see the same thing twice, and you run up and down corridors trying to get to what you want to go to. And they also have stuff for patients, including the um, what's it called? Oh, usually they have a big tent or a big room for patients, and they get. They can have uh, stuff for sale, or they can catch up with the advocacy groups. Um, oh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's fantastic. And you go in there, and sometimes some of the professors come in and give them a layman's term talk about what was happening in the plenary session that morning. Um, it's the most amazing thing to be at. I okay. remember the one in Vienna, it's actually the same, the one in Mexico is the same. You're sort of wandering down the corridor, and there'll be a eminent professor will wander by and then there'll be a transvestite wander by and then there'll be a nun and then there'll be this lady in this elegant African outfit it's unbelievably beautiful and then it'll just be you <laughs> oh I just thought I'm not doing anything <laughs> there'll be people parading and throwing condoms around really amazing so um, opportunity even if you just go to the it's the global village that's what it's called the global village is for the patients um, it'd be worth so hopefully it'll be very interesting so I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. So but some of that stuff is high, high tech, I imagine. So ask anything, even if it's unrelated to what I said, that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> that's all right. I know this stuff, is, this stuff is easy for me, but it's not easy for you. And I've talked about some hard things, hard drugs, I expect. Hopefully I gave you other interesting bits in between. Away. I'm in two minds. Initially, when we talked about it a couple of years ago, I was like, no, no, no. This is silly. Condoms. They're the greatest thing ever. They work. Um, and I'm still partly on that, but for the right people, probably in a serious discordant relationship, maybe it is the right thing if you were to organise yourself and, you know, your partner's on treatment, but you don't want to be that one tiny percentage. Perhaps if you were organising yourself and you had pre-exposure prophylaxis on the weekend or whatever it was before exposure or for serious discordant couples who are trying to conceive and they don't want to go through IVF, 
might be the thing as well. So it's one of those difficult things. And I don't know. We're still wrangling with it a lot. Um, and all the professors will have different opinions. Um, all the American professors go, yeah, what the hell, you know, because you have to buy your drugs over there, nobody cares. <laughs> so if the health is not the taxpayer that's paying for them, they're like, yeah, it's great, there's, there's evidence, go on it. Um, we're a bit more conservative here because it, it's not yet a private thing, you can't buy it privately, it's not TGA registered for it, and the public probably doesn't want to pay it $25 per pill for someone to have pre-exposure prophylaxis every day. So yeah, I, I'm in two minds, I'm going to sit in the fence a bit longer. <laughs> no, no, that's all right. Yeah, so if you've been around since the 80s, for example, um, and positive, there's a lot of patients obviously at the Alfred like that, not necessarily at all hospitals, and they have tried everything under the sun, and by the time they've got to now, all of really old drugs are dreadful and they stopped taking them and they started taking them and they had all... So essentially they've got virus that's been exposed to heaps of stuff and it's relatively resistant. HIV is pretty clever and also it fails a lot as it, muta as it divides, it mutates quite a lot and there are an awful lot of resistant viruses that can be archived. So you, you, know, you take a blood sample and you haven't got any virus in it, that doesn't mean it's not sitting in the lymph nodes. So yes, if you've been exposed years ago, treatment experience to all kinds of things and you stopped and started and you didn't like them very much, you've probably got archive resistance, so you need to go on really stronger things with your treatment experience, yeah. That's twice a day, yeah, so yeah, and, and you probably, that new whiz-bang, every clearer drug, even though it sounds brilliant because it's three in one, if you've been treatment experience, that's not the drug for you. Not, not, like the patients will want it and they will have heard of it and they will have researched it, but it's not the drug for them because their virus is likely to be a bit tougher than that. Yeah. Variable, um, years and years, or uh, it's really hard to say. Nobody knows. Um, you might not get diagnosed for 25 years. Certainly, we've had some interesting diagnoses at the Alfred and people who are 60 or 80, who obviously had some blood transfusion many moons ago, um, and obviously were unaware. So lifespan is, is very hard to say. And some people acquire a really nasty resistant virus and don't do anything about it. That's perhaps nastier. Um, yeah, very hard to say. So lifespan on treatment do fairly well, almost the same as you and I, but not on treatment, very hard to say. This patient asked me that the other day, actually, because he's wanting you know, to, go, to go to Bali and could, if he didn't take his pills, how would he feel for a couple of weeks? And I'm like, you'd feel fine, the virus would be right all over it though. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, there'd be nothing wrong with you. You wouldn't notice anything for the next six months. <laughs> he's like, oh, great. And I'm like, no, not great. <laughs> the virus will be like, yes. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, really, really hard to know. Depends what you come across as well in the sense of opportunistic nasty. You can just be one of those people that poke along for the next 20 years and never are exposed to anything. Um, you might get a nasty dose of shingles or something and think, oh, this is a bit of a pain compared to somebody else, but not know. Certainly that's where some of our elderly diagnoses have been. Yeah, it's hard to know. There's a study called the START study, um, where because that's very the very question we want to investigate. Certainly, we know less than 350 equals you, you're going to fall a cropper of some opportunistic weird thing. So you need to go on before that. But between 350 and 500, we don't know. And despite the fact that there's these large cohorts of 40,000 and 20,000 people. And they always seem to do better the sooner they go on treatment. There's no going forward randomised study to know. So there's a start study which is enrolling. So if you've got the right person, you might say, would you consider enrolling in the start study um, to see? So you go on immediately or you wait. Um, is that that study? I would probably advocate for going on, but the person would have to be sure about doing it because you can't stop once you've started. So you'd want to, you don't obviously use a nice high CD4 count. You don't have to rush you want to do research all your options and think about it for a while. Um, so individuals' concerns, you probably take them highly. Like if they're planning a pregnancy, get them on it. 
um, they've got a new partner, get them on it. But if they're fine and they're still thinking about it and they're really not sure, then don't because they, they muck it up accidentally. Really hard decisions. So yeah, very, very individual. Subgroups, yes, it is. Probably the other blokes. <laughs> There's this thing called, God, you learn a lot when you work in this field about things that you don't really want to know about. <laughs> There's this thing called zero sorting. <laughs> and if you go to a sex on premises venue and you find some other person that's also HIV positive, you choose to have sex with them. Um, and that's fabulous. You know, neither of you contract it because you already have it, but that doesn't mean you're not sharing resistant viruses. <laughs> So yes, in certain subpopulations there's problems, um, but not like overuse of antibiotics equals resistance. So we're really lucky. Once you get these drugs are so good that once the viral load's less than 50, chance of transmitting is really low. So the resistance is therefore really low in the general population. If you muck it up and stop and start and stop and start, then your own personal resistance <laughs> will then be high, and if, then you'll silly at some point and transmit that to someone else. So yeah, there are a few populations where <laughs> where it's there, and you would always screen someone if they were newly diagnosed. You'd you get, get a look at their virus and, and sequence it and send it off to Vidral or wherever you send it and just check um, if you've acquired a really resistant virus before you start treatment because otherwise you've mucked it up then, haven't you? You put them on the new heavy clear and then you discover they've acquired a resistant virus. That's a problem. So, yeah, we always check, even even for people who are you know diagnosed and they're 60 and they've lived in the country all their life, you still check just in case. It's fairly unlikely that that bloke from the country has acquired a nasty resistant virus, but you just don't know. Yeah. We're running out of time, sorry. <laughs>